Muscle Relaxants for Intubation by Dr. Robert Pascucci. Please note that in this video we will be following the guidelines used at Boston Children's Hospital. Some of this information may need to be modified based on the equipment, guidelines, and practices in place in your institution. Hi, I'm Bob Pascucci. I'm one of the ICU staff here at Children's Hospital Boston. What we're going to talk about today is the drugs that you might consider using in a semi-urgent intubation in the ICU setting. And I'll, I'll give you a sampling of the drugs that we use here. Some of them may or may not be available to you immediately where you are practicing, uh, but most of them are pretty commonly available and they're old, for the most part, they're older drugs that aren't uh, really brand new. Introduction. So now you've got the patient asleep, you've had your appetizer, you've had your main course. It's always nice to pause before you go on to dessert and maybe have a glass of wine, a little bit of salad, some sorbet. Pause here and make sure that you can ventilate the patient because obviously we don't want to paralyze somebody that's difficult to ventilate. So when you've got them nicely sedated, when you've got them asleep and you've got them to the point where you think you're almost ready to put the endotracheal tube in, make sure that you can ventilate them by hand. Uh, and obviously if you can, then you can move on to give a relaxant. If you can't, then discussion has to ensue about what the best way to manage the situ situation is, where there is to proceed on or whether it's to allow the child to wake up and go to a different plan, whatever seems to work. But make sure that you can ventilate the patient before we move on to, um, to muscle relaxation. And muscle relaxants are the dessert. Let's move over here. Uh, what are your choices? Well, you have succinylcholine and it's succinylmethonium in uh, many other countries. And then you have a variety of non-depolarizing muscle re relaxants which vary from institution to institution. Physiology. What are we trying to do here? We're trying to interrupt neuromuscular transmission. So my, my very cartoonish interpretation of that is you have a nerve, you have muscle, you have a junction, and you have a receptor on the muscle that receives acetylcholine that gets into the junction. So normal transmission is acetylcholine gets released into the junction, gets on the receptor, causes a chemical depolarization, electrical depolarization, a twitch, and then the acetylcholine is quickly metabolized away by a cholinesterase that's right there in the junction and you come back to normal. Then that's normal neuromuscular transmission. That's really what we're trying to affect, if you will, with all of these drugs. Now, how do they work? Well, succinylcholine looks like two acetylcholines joined back to back with an ester linkage and it gets onto the receptor, causes the depolarization and the twitch but it requires a circulating form of cholinesterase to get into the junction to clear it. And while that happens, the patient is still paralyzed because the receptor is still occupied. And typically in, in normal patients with normal uh, cholinesterase levels, that takes five or 10 minutes to happen so that the patient will initially have the depolarization and the twitch and then will be paralyzed for five or 10 minutes after that. That's succinylcholine. It is called a depolarizing muscle relaxant because of that action that it has on the muscle. All these other guys are non-depolarizing muscle relaxants and they do the same thing. They get into the uh, junction, they get on the receptor and they block it, but they don't cause depolarization. They just, it's a competitive antagonism between acetylcholine and pancuronium, for example. And if you give a patient a large dose of pancuronium, all the receptors are occupied by pancuronium. And until that gets excreted by whatever the excretion mechanism is, the patient will remain paralyzed. And if you don't do anything else to reverse that process, for example, the pancuronium eventually wears off, acetylcholine gets back onto the juncture, and you come back to normal transmission. The big difference is the non-depolarizers don't cause any muscle twitching. They just block the receptor. Succinylcholine will cause the muscle to twitch beforehand. Now, why is that such a big deal? Because if you have depolarization and you have muscle twitching, then you have a lot of movement of potassium, for example, from the intracellular space to the extracellular space, and your serum potassium can go up significantly. Um, so the first contraindication to using succinylcholine is a known high potassium. There are other contraindications to sucks, progressive neuromuscular disease, myopathies, but not necessarily static neuromuscular disease, are at higher risk of severe hyperkalemia. 
Similarly, crush injuries with extensive muscle damage can predispose to hyperkalemia with sucks. Burns and spinal cord injuries can do the same, although perhaps not until 8 to 12 hours after the injury. Finally, a known susceptibility to malignant hyperthermia is a definite contraindication to succinylcholine, as it is a known trigger for that disease. Succinylcholine. Now, why would you want to use succinylcholine? What's the advantage of it? Well, it's very potent, and it's very reliable, and it works very quickly. Its onset time is 60 seconds, and its offset time in most individuals is 5 or 10 minutes. So it's a quick onset, a quick offset, sort of matches some of the drugs over here. Um, it's a very reliable drug. If I have someone who's in laryngospasm, if I have someone who I know I could ventilate, but I need to get them paralyzed quickly, succinylcholine is the sort of the emergency drug that will do that. And I think, at least in my practice now, it's become exactly that. It's an emergency drug. It's something that's there if I have to paralyze somebody very, very quickly and I have no contraindication to using it, then succinylcholine would be a reasonable choice. Okay. For the most part in the ICU, we're not in that setting. We're sort of electively intubating somebody. It's urgent, but it's not emergent. The patient is under control, if you will, and we're taking our time to give appetizers and put the patient to sleep, then there's not that much of a rush to get the patient paralyzed quickly and there's really no need to use succinylcholine. Pancuronium and Vecuronium. And what we tend to do is use the non-depolarizers so that you get around this whole depolarization and potassium issue. There are a variety of them. Let me just clear this out a little bit here. Pancuronium, Vecuronium, and Cisantracurum are the ones that we commonly have in our unit. Uh, pancuronium and vecuronium are relatively, uh, not exactly like, but they're very similar. Uh, they're steroid-based compounds, which sometimes is an issue in terms of long-term use. Uh, they both take about, oh, three to four minutes to work if you give a smaller dose of 0.1 per kilo. If you give a larger dose of 0.2 per kilo, you may get these down to two to three minutes instead, so that you can make them work uh, relatively quickly, but they're not going to be as fast as succinylcholine. Pancuronium tends to be longer acting, typically about 45 minutes. Vecuronium tends to be shorter acting, typically about 20 minutes, and obviously this depends on the patient. Um, pancuronium has a little bit of vagolytic effect with it, so that the heart rate will tend to go up a little bit, and that's quite useful in intubating small children. So if for some reason you haven't given atropine as a premedication, then pancuronium actually might help prevent the vagally mediated response to laryngoscopy simply because it is a vagolytic. Vecuronium tends not to do that quite as much as pancuronium does. Either of these drugs are probably my workhorse uh, intubation drugs, the ones that I will typically pull out. And I tend to be a little bit more old-fashioned than many. I tend to pull out the pancuronium. Maybe it's because I like the vagolytic effect. Maybe it's because I like the fact that it's longer acting because Typically, when I'm intubating someone, I'm going to do something else to them. I'm going to put in an arterial line. I'm going to put in a central line. We're going to put them on the ventilator and try to get the settings right. And it's, I think, convenient to have the patient muscle relaxed for at least the initial phase of that so that you don't have to worry so much that they're going to react to what you're doing. Um, the downside of these drugs, that really the only downside, is that they are fairly heavily dependent on renal function for excretion. There are, there's a mix of renal and hepatic excretion, but it's pretty heavily renally based. So that if you have someone in renal failure, then you might not want to use pancuronium and vecuronium, or you might not want to use multiple doses of the drug. You might be able to get away with one dose. Cisatricurium. If you have somebody in renal failure or hepatic failure, then you can consider your third alternative here, which is cisatricurium. Cisatricurium is a different drug family. It's not a steroidal column. It's, it's really based on uh, curare. And uh, the initial drug was curare, and then it became atricurium, and then it became cisatricurium is one of the isomers of atricurium. Um, it doesn't require either renal function or hepatic function. It has Hoffman degradation, which means that if you take the molecule, put it at physiologic temperature and pH, it self-destructs over a period of time. And typically, the onset time for cisatricurium will be about the same as these guys, two, three, four minutes. You can't safely, at least I tend not to double the dose of cisatricurium simply because although 
cis-adricurum itself doesn't tend to have a lot of histamine release. That drug class does, curare certainly does, atricurum certainly does, and I, I'm just a little bit concerned that if I start increasing the dose of cis atricurum, I may get a little bit of histamine release and hypotension that I don't necessarily want. Um, so using the standard dose, 0.2 per kilo, I'd expect two to three minutes as an onset time and about 20 minutes as an offset time. Um, and that's fine. And, and again, for a short procedure like an intubation, that may be exactly what you want. Um, at least in the United States, this atricurum tends to be more expensive than these other drugs. And so I would tend to limit my use of cis to somebody that I either want a very short period of muscle relaxation or somebody where I'm concerned about renal failure. Rocuronium. Finally down here we have rocuronium. And it's, it's a little separated from these guys. It's the same drug. It's a non-depolarizing muscle relaxant. It's a mix of renal and hepatic excretion, but it's more hepatic, I think, than renal. Um, What's the advantage of rocuronium? Well, if you give the standard dose of rocuronium, it works in about two minutes. So it's a little bit faster than these other drugs, and it wears off in about 20 minutes. If you double the dose up to 1.2 milligrams per kilogram, then the onset time comes down to one minute. So now you have a drug that's a non-depolarizing agent but works as fast as succinylcholine. So if I'm in a rush to get the tube in, if I'm doing a rapid sequence induction, if I'm urgently needing to get the patient paralyzed, and I'm concerned about using sucks because I don't want to have to deal with the hyperkalemia, then rocuronium is the drug that I'm going to choose. And I can get the onset time to be as fast with rocuronium as I can with succinylcholine. You do, if you double this dose up to get the fast onset, you also, it no, no longer wears off in 20 minutes, now it's going to last about 40 minutes so that if you should make a mistake and you have difficulty getting the tube in, then you're gonna to have to suffer that for a longer period of time with rocuronium than you would with suctional choline so that if you're really concerned that the intubation is going to be difficult, uh, and it's safe to give succinylcholine, then you might consider using sux instead of rock just because if you make a mistake, it will wear off relatively quickly. Whereas if you make a mistake with rocuronium and you can't get the tube in, then you're stuck with having to bag ventilate the mask or mask ventilate the patient for an extended period of time with rocuronium. Summary. So that's our approach to uh, use of drugs for intubation. We don't use them all the time. If you have someone who is <clears throat> completely unconscious and receiving um, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, there's probably no role for this sort of stuff. But in the average ICU patient who is progressing along the course of respiratory failure, but is awake and is a child and is anxious and is um, you know, appropriately scared of the procedure, it makes perfect sense. It gives the patient a degree of comfort for the intubation and it gives the intubating people uh, the best possible conditions for doing so. Thanks. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.